a few days. Seven weeks. So you got seven weeks. And how many hours a week do you spend on these projects? Too much. <laughs> I don't know what too much means. So maybe maybe you've got 60, 70 hours of your time available. You've got 60, 70 hours of your time available over the next seven weeks. Does that sound about right? Kind of. Also more. Blank looks. We, we understand that there will be more of that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so what I decided to do was give you some thoughts around, you know, how to, you know, how to finish your project. Um, but also, I kind of subtitled this, how to present something when you're still in discovery mode. Which is kind of tricky. So, first of all, you know, entrepreneurship, which is what you're learning to do, is about seeing not just what it is, not just being aware of reality, but envisioning a more positive. Not seeing the world just as it is, but as it can be or as it ought to be. And then um, you know, knowing that you can make it happen and taking action to make that happen. So this is what you've been doing. You're like, maybe there can be this you know, gizmo that keeps roller coasters from falling. Or maybe there's this new cracker that's going to happen. And you're envisioning this positive future. Um, and, uh, and this is something that's really fundamental. And, and so this is something that you're learning. So that there, there's two aspects of this project. One is the outcome of the project itself. But the other aspect of this is what's happening between your ears. Right? So, so you're learning a new way of dealing with reality. You're learning a new way to envision the future. And you're learning new skills and attitudes and beliefs around, I can make this positive future happen. And this is something really fundamental to what it means to be a human being. That like, regardless of what happens with the sugar project, regardless of what happens whether anybody buys your cookie or not, regardless of whether Barilla says, oh, great, thank you very much, and it's dead, like there's something that you personally get out of this project. And it's this, this, this something more fundamental than just a business discipline. Like, like we're, we're doing more than just helping you understand pro forma cash flow projections and design thinking methodologies. If there's this new, you know, envisioning a positive future and, and then taking action to bring about that positive future. That you're not just a passive recipient of, oh, if only the government would make my life better, or if only my mom and dad would make my life better, or if only my boyfriend or girlfriend would make my life better, but it's like you have control over your life. And you could do this to either start up a new business, you could do this inside somebody else's business, and every, every CEO, every president, every manager, the number one thing that, it, when, when I say, what are you looking for in employees? The number one thing they're looking for is somebody who's self-motivated. Somebody who, I hire you, and within two months, like, I don't know how you became the most important person in the company. But suddenly, like, nobody can do a PowerPoint anymore without you making it look better. Nobody can do a spreadsheet anymore without you making the numbers correct. Nobody wants to send an email anymore without you, like, suddenly making it look better. And suddenly you've gone from some random kid we hired to like, oh my god, you're the second most important person in the company. Like, we need you for all kinds of things. And people are looking for these self-directed people that just kind of get into a company and find good stuff to do. And just kind of like make the company a better place. And they don't wait to sit there and go, tell me what to do. Hmm. Well, what do you want me to do today, boss? I'm just going to sit here, you know, with my thumb up my bum and like, tell me what to do. Like, nobody wants those people. They want people to say, I don't know what to do. Like, go, go find something exciting. Go find something important to do. Go, like, I, I don't know, try not to break anything. Try not to poison anybody. <laughs> but, like, go do good stuff. And, and they don't know what to tell you to do. Like, most employers, when they hire you, they're like, well, I've got, like, two or three things that I need you for. But I, I really don't know what I'm going to get you to do. And, and either I'll give you too many things or too many vague things or, like, most, most, the onboarding process for most employees sucks. We kind of sort of give you an office and introduce you to your colleagues and like, there you go, see your next performance appraisal. <laughs> they give you a job title and like, ah, 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 bleh, go out and do something. And, 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 and what happens is what I call seagull management. Everybody knows what a seagull is? Yeah. Anybody not know? People do Chavino. <laughs> Here's what seagulls do. You know what this is? Here's what seagulls do. You're having a picnic. You're happy. You're having a good day. You're eating your picnic. You're eating your panino. 
you got your glass of wine, and suddenly squawk, 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 shit all over the place. <laughs> she deals your food, and, and then they go. This is how most management takes place. You're sitting in your office, you've been there three weeks, life is grand, here I am, look at me, I finally figured out where the bathroom is, I'm doing my thing. Suddenly the boss shows up, squawk, 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 poop all over the place, and he's gone. What the hell just happened? I thought I was doing a good job. And like there's these episodic, you know, people are unhappy, I don't know what you're doing, I don't like what you're doing, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you feedback. This is the shitting part. I'm gonna give you feedback. And so you kind of need to be proactive. You kind of need to be taking action inside your company and making stuff happen and kind of sort of feeding the seagull to keep the seagull away. So that the boss never, like you don't want the boss thinking about you at three o'clock in the morning. Like whatever happened to that new person I hired? Yeah, I haven't seen her in two weeks. I wonder if she's doing anything. I'm gonna stop by her office tomorrow and give her some positive motivation and encouragement. Squawk, 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 squawk. <laughs> so what you're learning is, is it's how to work inside a company. You're also learning anything that you want to do for the rest of your life in terms of community, outreach, making the world a better place. But also, the fourth area is to look at yourself, to look at your own life as a human being and say, how can I be entrepreneurial towards my own life? Not just entrepreneurial towards starting a company, entrepreneurial inside a company, entrepreneurial towards the culture, but how can I look at myself and be entrepreneurial towards my own life and make me a better me? How can I improve my value proposition? How can I improve my business model? How can I improve my skill level? How can I become a better human being? How can I improve my character? So, like, this is what, this is, did, did anybody tell you this is what this course is really all about? You say, blank looks, what? Francesco, you never told me any of this. We thought we just needed to make Barilla happy and Wasa happy and Pochipolini happy. Like, like, you can't make Pochipolini happy. You can't make them happy. Like, they're either happy or unhappy on their own. Like, they're going to go off merrily without you. And, you know, three years from now, they won't remember your name. Like, so they're, they're yes, they're the clients, but at the end of the day, you're, you're the clients of the sugar program to learn these things. So, um, you know, what, what people think, you know, the world looks like is this kind of straight line over here. And, and I, I assume um, uh, Matteo gave you the, the hunting versus agriculture thing. You all got that? So this is agriculture over here. You know, you plant corn, you give it water and sunlight. You know, six months later, there's corn. You don't have to look for it. It didn't run away. You know where the corn is. The corn grows. Very predictable. Design thinking is this thing on the right here. It's, 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 it's hunting. You don't know where it's going to be. You might go hungry. Oh, we thought bridges loved us. Eh, forget bridges. Oh, roller coasters. Eh, forget roller coasters. Ah, oh, we're going after a service thing. Eh, that didn't work. Eh, uh, we're going after, uh, I don't know, government contract. Eh, I don't know. Why did you people build this thing? I don't know. We're going to go after here. And you may or may not find anything. This is the trouble with hunting. You know, sometimes it's faster than you are. You go out to try to kill something, you didn't get anything. So, you know, we think the world is looking like this, but the real life, this is your life over here, too. You know, you think, oh, I'm going to, you know, uh, turn 20, I'm going to go to university, I'm going to get married, I'm going to have 2.5 children, I'm going to have a dog, I'm going to get an apartamento, and uh, the world's going to be great. And, you know, it turns out, oh, sh shucks, <laughs> you know, my husband's gay, my, <laughs> my dog poops everywhere, uh, I had a kid and I hate kids, <laughs> nobody told me what rotten little beasts children were, I thought they were all going to be wonderful, mom, why did you tell me to have this thing, I thought you loved me, why did you want me to have kids, you wanted to make me miserable. It doesn't turn out the way you thought. Your projects might not turn out the way you thought. You go through all this hard work, and Barilla says, thank you very much. Molto piacere. Ciao. We're not doing it. Maybe it happens. Maybe it doesn't happen. You don't know. So, you know, we, we talked about, I was telling you a little bit, you know, you, you've, you've been using design thinking methods so far to understand the problem, create a solution, measure your design a business model, and you're kind of sort of right around here. Um, so here's the big question. 
How do you stand up in front of a group of people when you're in the middle of this thing going on over here? And you want to like act like you know what you're talking about. This is the big challenge. You know, every, every PowerPoint presentation you give, you kind of want to act like the world is like this. But in reality, your stomach's going, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't know what people are going to buy. Like, I'm asking them for $5 million investments, and it ain't my money. I don't know. Like, you know, we, we, we built some food thing, but the app doesn't actually work. And, uh, but yet, you got to stand up, and you're like, look at me. Da, da, da. And sometimes students have this desire to, to be fake. Like to kind of stand up and go, I know exactly what I'm talking about. I want to make a good presentation. I want to make a good impression on you. And I kind of act like I know more than I really do. And you kind of sort of want to make a presentation as though the world were on the left. But in reality, you're kind of like, sorry, Poggi Polini. Like, I don't have a clue. Like, I don't know. Like, why are you asking me to know? Like, you know, how much money do people spend on this? What? I'm just a student. It's like, blah. Like, you guys should know. You guys should have told us this a long time ago. It wasn't going to work. What am I standing up here for? And so you got to be honest with yourself. Sorry to pick up what you're doing. Right. <laughs> At least I'm not calling him pee-pee anymore. Um, it's, um, and so there's always this tension between you want to make a good impression, and, and, and you've been told all your life, like, you got to kind of sort of stand up here, and you got to have confidence, and you got you to gotta speak with authority, and you got to believe in yourself, and da, da, da. but over here, you're like, I have no idea what's going to happen. It's probably going to fail. How do I ask these people for 5 million euros for a two-year project on the, 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 wa, the Wassolini? That's my Wassa Italian eyes. Wassolini, and it's going to be this, and it's going to be that, and, you know, but it's not my $5 million, and pff, I'm going to be gone long before you know, they find out that it was a great idea or not. So, um, so this, is, this, is, this is a tough question. How to present when you're still in discovery. So, you know, part of the key is to consider every presentation just another prototype. Don't fall in love with your presentation in the same way you shouldn't fall in love with your prototype. Um, it's just another opportunity to practice. It's another opportunity to check your assumptions. It's another opportunity to see if the story makes sense. It's another opportunity to get people motivated, maybe. Um, it's another opportunity to potentially sell your vision of the future, whatever that vision may be, while also remaining authentic. Again, because you don't want you don't want to ever lie. You don't want to act like you know something when you don't. But you kind of want to let people know, like this is this is our hypothesis, but we don't know. This is what we this is what we know we know. This is the data that we know. This is the data that we don't. Know. And and they can make their own decisions. They can ask their own questions. But um, you know, it's an opportunity to use this as a prototype. So um, you, know, you always want to balance the fact, what you know, versus what you think might be. Now, this might not be as important for, for the sugar project as sometimes it is for startup companies. So for example, you've got a lot of startup companies here at Alma Cube that maybe you're asking an investor for money. And you kind of want to say to the investor, this is a great idea. I've devoted my life to this idea. You should give me a half a million euros. You know, so you, you know, but, but, but don't lie to the investor. A, the investor is probably smart enough to know if, it's, if you're full of BS. And, and, and investors, you know, they're smart people. They can figure out, you know, fact from fiction on their own. And so you never want to lie about something. Because as soon as you violate that trust, then you're toxic. As soon as you violate that trust, you're toxic. No investor is going to touch you. No employer is going to hire you. You're just a scumbag. You're just, you know, oh, ugh. you stood up there and lied to me. Um, and, and sorry to keep talking about this, but, but a lot of my students do this all the time. Like they stand up in front of a classroom and they think that they're performing Romeo and Juliet. You know, it's like, oh, Juliet, I love you. Don't break my heart. Don't act like you're falling in love with me if you're not really falling in love with me. I mean, when you're an actor, yeah, okay, it's okay to pretend you're falling in love. But, like, we're not acting here. Like, this is, this is reality. This is real life. Like, these are project people that really want to know what did you really discover? What did you really know? 
And, um, and, and so you're always kind of balancing what you know from what you hope might be possible. Um, and so to some extent you're always selling yourself, but you want to sell yourself as an authentic human being, not as some fake two-dimensional actor on a stage that's like going through some performance because like you're trying to get a good grade or something like that. Do you get a grade in this? No. Is this? No. Yeah, so, that, so that's great. So there's no reason to lie. Because you have nothing to benefit from, from being full of BS up here. So the big question I wanted to ask um, you, uh, in, in terms of preparation for this last like seven week sprint, is you know, uh, what do you want to get out of this in the next seven weeks? Like what do you want to do after sugar is over? You know, do you want to do you want to continue on the project? Do you want to start up a company? Like are you going to start up a company that sells way things and, and, and apps and you've got a service company? Like I see, no, you're not going to do it. No, no, no. So what do you want to get out of this? Like once this thing is done, like eight weeks from now, Aside from being a better human being, <laughs> which is important, like what else do you want to get out of this? Do you want a job? Do you want anybody to hire you out of this? This is important. This is an important question. You know, I mean, to some extent, if you're just wrapping up the project, what do you want to put on your resume? Because that's kind of the one really quantifiable thing. Put on your resume. I went through the sugar project. It was a nine month long thing and I blah. What's that sentence going to be? Or two sentences or three bullet points. Because at the end of the day, that's really going to be the single biggest quantifiable. Like, and if you look at my resume, like I've just got page after page after page of like, hey, I'm a CEO of this company. Great, you get one bullet point. <laughs> What's your one bullet point for three years of your life? If it's a big enough thing, okay, it was a publicly traded company with 26 subsidiaries in 15 countries, you know, you get two bullet points. There you go. But like, you know, 10 years from now, like you're, you're not gonna put this much on a resume about this project. You're gonna have a bullet point, maybe, maybe three lines. Like, what are you gonna put? And that's the thing to really drive towards. How about you? Do you want to start up a business around this? Actually, I told them that I want to be a coach, sugar coach. <laughs> okay, so that's good. So you want to get a job, not for Barida, but for uh, at all the kids. Okay, good. Well, that's good. So you want to impress people, you want to do a good job, you want to make sure the client is happy, right? But it is a good client. Like, ah, 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 impress the client. You guys don't have to do any more work. Is it 70 hours? Like, it just turned to 50 hours, 40 hours, 30 hours, 140 hours. Thanks, buddy. You're doing all the work. You've got to impress everybody. Not only that, but you have to impress Francesco that you're capable of motivating me. Like, okay, I was going to do 30 hours, but if you motivate me enough, I'll give you 40. Start motivating. Come on, bring it up. No, I'm just kidding you. <laughs> but, so, so that's important. So you want to put something on this related to what you learned. Um, and so it's not just the outcome of the project itself, but your understanding of the coaching process and the steps that you went through. And um, so, so maybe, maybe what, what your team might want to do, for your benefit at least, is to like really go through in detail, like this is what we learned, this is why we did it this way, this is the methodology that we did, here's lots of pretty graphs and figures and tables, and this is a reproducible thing that now, like give me some other crackers, give me some 3D pasta, give me some Wazzolini too, I don't know, whatever, give me some other things and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. And, uh, I don't know, um, you know, I'm going to integrate it with the Future Food Institute thing and, you know, we're going to add that. So, what's the guy up north in Bolsano that's got, like, the headgear you can put on people and measure their neural pathways? Have you heard about this one? Timus. Yeah, Timus. 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 So, like, maybe, maybe you should add that onto your, onto your list of methodologies that you've used and, uh, you know, kind of, like, really, really bolster kind of the, hey, clients, if you hire me, Look at this big, thick document you're going to get with all this stuff we're going to do. And I'm an expert in the food 
B2C kind of sort of space. Um, and that, that might be kind of an outcome that you might want at least. What do you want to get out of this? I hope I'm not scaring you. Like, Holy shit, I don't want anything out of this. I'm out of here. Yeah. Here's <laughs> the lost half the team. I'm not getting graded? I thought there was an award at the end of this thing. I'm out of here. Now you can start negotiating. Hey, for 100 euros an hour, I'm going to help you write this great report. You should all know what you're getting out of this personally, besides just the education. And to make sure that within like the next seven weeks, like you're, you're driving towards that. Um, and and, and uh, for a lot of people, having a portfolio is really important. That when you go to a company and they say something like, if I were to hire you, what's the kind of stuff you know how to do? Well, I'm really good at you point all the stuff on your resume, and then um, what you want is you want, um, I mean the technical jargon would be called an assurance of learning. Here is my demonstrated <coughs> proficiency of mastery. Here's my demonstration of mastery at the things that I claim I know how to do. So if you say you're good at making PowerPoint presentations, show me some great PowerPoint presentations. Clearly that's not something on my resume. If you're really good at making, like, you know, project managing a report, you should be able to point to something and say, I'm a good project manager. Here's my Gantt charts, here's my weekly breakdowns, here's my, uh, here's, here's the final report, see how good it is, and it's well written, and it's grammatically correct, and it looks beautiful. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm really good at using design thinking methods, and here's my demonstration of mastery at the design thinking process. Um, so those are all things you want to be able to point to as, as part of this portfolio. Otherwise, anybody can show up at a, at, at a job interview and say, oh yeah, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, sure, I can do that. Oh yeah, I'm a great graphic artist. Huh? Show you how to do it. Uh, I don't have a copy of Adobe uh, Creative Suite on my computer. You don't have a copy of Adobe Creative Suite on your computer and you say you know how to do graphics? What application would you use? Uh, paint? <laughs> like, yeah. You know, you gotta, you gotta be able to demonstrate things. I mean, at least for most jobs in North America, nobody hires you based on what you say, because everybody, everybody says good things at, a res at an interview. You have to, like, demonstrate by pointing at things. Here's a report I wrote. Here's a project that I delivered on. Here's a, here's a thing that I did. And so this is a primary outcome that you get out of this learning experience is the final presentation, the final report. And, and that becomes a thing that probably for the next three, four, five years of your life you can point to is probably, you know, I mean, for, for many of my students in your age group, this would probably be the single biggest thing they've ever done in their lives up until this time in their age in terms of a project that they would have done. Like, hire me because I can do that thing. Very often you graduate from university and like hire me because I did, well, I answered multiple choice questions in an exam. I, I, I read a book, I sat on my ass in a lecture and didn't cause problems. Um, um, did I mention I read a book? Uh, I passed some exams, like, like show me what you can do. And usually it's project work, project work, project work is, is what people want to see. What would you like to get out of this? You don't know? You might want to think about that and think about this with your team. Like, why are we doing this and what would we like to get out of this? Um, sometimes what you get out of this is a network of people. You know, I mean, if you're interested in these people, you're like, this is a great excuse to say, I'm not asking you for a job today, <laughs> but I do want to make a connection because I'm selling this other thing and I want to talk with you about that other thing. And they're like, wow, you're pretty good. I'm not interested in your in your gizmo, but like, yeah, I, you seem really nice, ah, great, but now you got a connection with, you know, three high-level individuals within five different companies, and so maybe, you know, I'm not sure, what, what's, what's your degree in? Law. Law. <laughs> <laughs> think, what kind of law do you want to specialize? Do you want to become a avocado? Avocado? Maybe yes. Maybe, uh, you don't know yet? <laughs> Okay, you don't have to choose actually. Um, yes, maybe yes, but uh, you can change on your way because you choose your branch of uh, specification. Mm -hmm. 
and then you try and send your application applications to different employees. Do you want to work for a law firm or do you want to work for inside? I will try each? both, but I prefer to try to start with a law firm because you need some specific and practical preparation. Yeah, yeah. Um, commercial litigation? Is that the yeah. kind of stuff you want to do? Yeah, taxation, commercial, company law. I'm trying to see. I'm coming up with a spin here. Yeah. Aha! If you would like to reduce your exposure to legal liabilities for your existing infrastructure, I have a really important game-changing gizmo yeah. that's going to reduce your legal exposure. Would you like to have a free consultation around your legal exposure to, you know, what, what are you doing? What's your compliance policy around um, staying on top of the latest technological developments in the infrastructure business? Because my guess is if your bridge falls down and you didn't have one of these suckers installed, you're going to jail. You want to have a conversation around that? Like, hey, that's an interesting spin. Mm -hmm. Ah. So, you know, very often you can find a personal angle mm -hmm. of something that you're interested in, and you can actually speak with authority now. Now you're talking to some engineer who's like, oh my God, the lawyer contacted me about getting sued about something, did it? and there was a big stamp in the lower right hand corner, and I don't understand any of it. Um, my wife's a lawyer, so um, my, my own personal in house legal. So um, that might be something cool to put on your resume, mm -hmm. is that you, you evaluated the legal liabilities of companies within, uh, who, who, are, who are investigating the possibility of implementing new technological approaches to mitigating damages in their... It's not just about liability, it's also about to create failure, legal failure. To create legal failure? Yeah, to create value in a legal way. Ah, okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that even better. <laughs> now, see? See, you're way ahead of me on that one. Good. Um, so, so that's my biggest kind of sort of suggestion is, is um, don't just view this project as this, like, thing that's out there that you got to do when you don't know why you're doing it. I'm like, oh, I signed up to do this and I kind of made a commitment to these other three people and I don't want to be a jerk. And I kind of sort of do it, but like, you know, weather's starting to get nice, you know, pasta's coming, you know, oh, I gotta do this thing. Like, 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 don't leave this as project as something outside of you that you're doing kind of against your will. Kind of sort of bring it into your life and selfishly say, how is this going to help me in achieving my personal goals? And then, you know, when it's, uh, you know, Three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, and the birds are singing, and you're like sitting inside somewhere. You're like, no, no, this is important. I'm glad I'm doing this. This is an important thing. And it's going to get worse as it gets into May. Um, you know, you get this. You know, God, I'm sick of this stupid project. How do we just get this thing done? Um, but don't, don't, don't treat it that way. Treat it as, 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 a, as, a, as a personal value towards yourself. Um, so, any any questions about any of that? So there's a bunch of different formats that a, a, a pitch can potentially take. So um, here's an example of a bunch of different kinds of pitches. Um, this is being videotaped, and I'm happy to. Francesco's got a copy of this, so I'm happy to have it available to everybody. You know, there's your personal pitch, which is usually around 30 seconds. You know, you meet somebody at a uh, um, networking event, and you shake their hand, like so. Tell me about yourself. Now is a lousy time to go, oh, uh, I'm, um, um, uh, what's my name? Uh, why am I here? Um, 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 uh, and then you're like, and it's like, it's like, like the first time you've ever given any thought to introducing yourself is after somebody's already shaking your hand and asked you, so, oh, you're graduating soon. Are you looking for a job? What are you looking for? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, come on. Like, do your thinking ahead of time. You, it's like a button you should push, you know, and like, What's your, what, what do you want for a living? Oh, it's like, oh, hi, my name's Steve Gideon. I've done my, my third career right now. My first career is this, my second career is this, and this is what I'm really good at. This is why I'm here. Like, oh, thank you very much. You don't even have to think about it. It's just like, you know, somebody triggers your pitch, bleh, you give your pitch. And then evaluate the feedback and continuously improve the pitch. So you should know what your pitch is. And each of you should have your pitch. 
and it usually includes something like, hi, this is my name, um, and, and if your name is difficult, then you have to make it easy for the other person. So, uh, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't want to pick on anybody. What, what, what's your name? Emma. No, it's <laughs> That's the I can remember Emma. Uh, what's your name? Eleonora. See, we're in Italy now. This is, this is too easy. Let, let me give you a better example. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, back in Toronto, it's a very diverse culture. You know, my students frequently will introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Eleonora. Just the other one. <laughs> Did anybody remember what I just said? I let him say a word. Can you repeat it? No. You see, this is the problem. Like, if I have to repeat my name three times and you still don't get my name, you're never going to ask me again. And you're never going to call me. And you're just going to be like, okay, he's that weird guy who I'm just embarrassed <laughs> and I don't remember his name. And so if your name's I let him say a word, and your mom calls you that, like, you can't say, you can't say it like that. You have to say, my name's Alad de Bissi, Al de Popo, call me Bissi. Bissi, B-I-S-I. Ah, okay. Bissi, I can remember Bissi, B-I-S-I. If you got a name tag, you can point at your name tag, my name's Bissi, call me Bissi. People can remember that. Otherwise, you know, hi, my name's François Dumont. Excuse me? François Dumont. Like, I'm, I'm so, like I, I get that your mom understands what that means, but like, what? It's Francois Dumont. Francois, call me Francis. Oh, okay, Francis Dumont. Okay, I know it's hard for a French person to call himself Dumont. But he's like, my name isn't Dumont, it's Dumont. But like, in Canada, well, actually in Toronto, in, in the United States, nobody can remember Dumont. It's like, bleh, bleh. I can't remember Dumont. So say your name. And you should know your pitch. And it should be, you know, uh, here's either here's what I'm looking for, and here's two or three things I'm good at, with maybe some kind of a validation. You know, I'm I'm uh, I'm really good at engineering because I have a PhD from MIT. Oh, okay. Not just like, oh, I'm really good at engineering. Well, who the hell do you think you are? Think that you're good at? Or I'm good at leadership. Every 20 year old thinks they're good at leadership. Really? What have you ever led in your life? Like you're 20 years old. I'm not going to hire you to lead anything. Like you're 20 years old. Why would I hire you? But if you're like, hi, I'm really good at leading. I was the captain of my hockey team every year for eight years in a row, and we won the national championship. Okay, maybe you're good at leadership. <laughs> but to just say I'm good at leadership or I'm good at teamwork, everybody's good at teamwork. <laughs> so, so ideally, say what you're good at with some level of validation. Um, another big pitch is your elevator pitch related to a business or a venture or a thing that you're doing. So. Um, So tell me in two minutes, what's your what, what's your business? What, what's your what, 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 what's this what's your sugar project about? Okay, uh, we have this time ball with a sensor inside, which can intercept physical phenomena like vibration, pressure, temperature, and others. <coughs> and we need to discover new markets uh, um, other than aerospace or uh, motorsport, uh, which are already covered by the company. And maybe try to find to um, we have to um, create a service around this product, so in a new market fit. Okay, that's pretty good. It was less than two minutes. Thank you very much for that. Uh, you didn't mention the name of the company, what do you mean? so you might want might have, might have wanted to do that. Um, you know, it's not clear why it has to be a service necessarily, but that's okay. Like you decided it's going to be a service, so that's good. Otherwise, I thought that was good. It was very comprehensive comprehensible, very, very understandable. Uh, um, it's always surprising to me how many people have a, have a company. Like, oh, tell me what your company does. And they go on and on and on and on. I'm like, I don't get it. Like, dude, I, I, I'm paying attention and I'm a smart person. If I don't get it, that's your fault. Like, I'm not a stupid human being. If you can't make me understand, you can't make anybody understand. So, like, you gotta be able to, like, Get your idea across. Very, very, very simple. And then there's the investor pitch, which is probably going to start to look very similar to what your final presentations are going to be. How long are your final presentations? Well, the final presentation in, um, in San Francisco can be shorter than that because there will be so many teams. So I would say I, I expect like 12, 13 minutes. That's pretty short. But like the, the presentation that they do to the company waits longer, uh, 20 even more. 
Okay. So, so let's say there is a presentation with all the sugar teams and there is a presentation for the mm -hmm. company that, that is like a little bit more specific on okay. investment. Okay, so you'll change this in that case. So you'll have, you'll have the, 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 the San Francisco pitch, 12 minutes, um, and then you'll have the, uh, the final uh, client pitch, which will be a different amount of time. Yeah. You'll probably have some kind of a final report, Yeah. around 20 pages-ish. Ah uh, yeah, even more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, like, we, we want to we want to keep it as short as possible, but of course there is like many. many, many like, so yeah, stuff. this is always a tough one. Um, so the the um, here's 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 the big thing to to keep in mind, and uh, we've got we've got a few minutes, right? Yeah. So let me let me let, let me really hammer this point home in that case. Um, and this, this will probably be the second most important thing I'll tell you today. The first one being, um, you know, make sure that you're personally benefiting from this project and that you identify what your selfish interest is in the outcome and the deliverable of what you're trying to get out of this project. But the second most important thing I'm probably going to say is uh, it's, it's the idea of essentialization. Uh, and, and it's called, the, the technical thing is called crow epistemology. Who knows what a crow is? Un tipo di Corvo. So Corvo, they're, they're the smartest bird. Um, and here's the story. Um, a farmer walks into a, farm, uh, into a field of corn and all the crows fly away. Farmer's got a gun. He wants to shoot the crows because they're eating the corn. Walks into the, crow field, walks into the corn field and the crows all fly away. Stands around, the crows are like, we see you. <laughs> he walks away, the crows come back. Crows can count to one. Crows are smart. Second day, two farmers go into the field, the crows fly away, one farmer leaves. The crows are not fooled. The crows can count to two. Next day, three farmers walk in, the crows fly away, two farmers walk out. The crows aren't fooled. They're like, ah, we know there's still somebody there. <laughs> The next day, four farmers walk in, the crows fly away, three farmers walk out, the crows come back. And the fourth farmer shoots the crows. Aw, oh, poor crows. But the moral of the story is, here's how crows count. They count one, two, three, many. Many farmers walked in, many farmers walked out. Okay. That's all they can do. Crows are beings of limited consciousness. They don't, they can't form concepts. They can only, they're like one, two, they're, they're perceptual. They, they view things at the perceptual level. So imagine that if I showed you like a hundred pieces of spaghetti and you looked at them and now I took away 90 and said, you know, did I take away all? You'd say, yeah, I took them all. Because perceptually you can't, you can't, you can't, you, you can't tell the difference between 90 and 100. If I showed you 90 or 100, you'd say those were the same. But because you can count, you can go, ah, oh, okay, I can count, da -da -da -da, that's 100, da -da -da, 90, aha, 90 is not the same as 100, there must be some left. But human beings are, have limited consciousness. You just can't remember 100 things. You can't remember 7 things. Most people can remember 3 or 4 things. And so, whenever you want to make a presentation, whenever you want to make a point, Whenever you're telling your boyfriend he did something wrong, like never go more than three. Tell three things. Because other than that, it just, it just turns into noise. And after the fourth thing and the fifth thing, they've forgotten the second and the third thing. And this is just the way human beings are. You just can't remember it all. And so what you have to do is you have to kind of like lump things together and say, I'm going to tell you about three things. Here's the first thing that I'm going to tell you about. And now you can talk about a bunch of different things under number one. But it's like, okay, I'm remembering that there's only three things. And like, you put a bunch of stuff under number one. Then you have to summarize number one. Now you can move on to number two. Now you can kind of sort of confuse people with number two. And then you summarize number two. Here's number three. Da -da. And so you have to, and, and the problem is as soon as you add a fourth thing, you reduce the importance of the other three. So, I mean, there's, there's nothing magical about three or four. I mean, you can do four every once in a while, maybe even five. But the point is, like, it's, 
So we're talking about this thing, like how many pages to make it. If you give somebody a 100-page document, and it's like, first we tried this, and then 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 we tried this. just kill me. Like, they quit reading. And then finally, you said something important, kind of buried in the middle of page number 23. You can't do it like that. The way you got to always write things is, in the first sentence, here's the main outcome of the thing. Today, we are recommending a new Wasili uh, cracker for the Italian market, and, and we recommend that you go ahead and spend the money on bringing this into reality. First sentence. Don't, like, it's not a murder mystery. It's not a, oh, I wonder who did it. I wonder what the answer is going to be. Do they want me to make a cracker or not? Like, don't make him get to page 20 to find out, like, you know, did the butler kill the person? Like, what's, what's going to happen? And so, um, so, so make, make it very clear right from the beginning. And, and let the appendix do all of the, like, if they're interested, they'll look into the appendix. So that I talk about more than three things, I only talk about two things. <laughs> Any questions around that? So you always want to have, so whenever you're, you know, making a point, you either have to essentialize by, like, discarding things, right? So the essential um, message is you should make the new cracker. There, you essentialized it. They got it. They understood it. Nice short sentence. Sometimes that sentence is its own paragraph. Because here's what happens otherwise. You know, you, you write, uh, you know, you, you, you know, on a page. You know, if you got all this stuff. And somewhere kind of down here, you say, I recommend that you go ahead and spend money on this. Like, you buried it under, like, blah, 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 you should buy this. Blah, 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 blah. And, like, and you dribble out these important points. So you never want to say anything important kind of in the middle of a paragraph or at the bottom of a page or in the middle of something. Like, if you, you know, put it right here at the very beginning of a, of a paragraph. And ideally, put a bullet point in front of it. It's like, hey, this is important. We have three recommendations in our proposal. One, make a new cracker. Two, do further testing. Three, hire this guy to do version three of the new sugar project or something like that. Um, and, and then, you know, people, people can then grasp what it is. So you kind of have to get to the essentials um, so people can understand it. Particularly important when talking with uh, loved ones, children, or professors. Like, they just don't pay attention. So emails to any professor, Mateo, please send the document. <laughs> Space, space, space. <laughs> Repeat yourself. Don't forget to send that document. Then you can put a bunch of other stuff. But otherwise, like, you know, if you kind of like, oh, here's a bunch of things, you in the middle, oh, please don't forget to send the document, pfft, he'll never send the document. Not just picking on Mateo, it's all professors. Okay. Some are worse than others. Some are definitely worse than others. I'm not saying who's worse or not. Um, any questions around that? I think those I mean, are yeah, the guys, things. does it mix? I mean, this is something that you have been experiencing a little bit during already. I mean, on presentation one plus documentation, presentation two plus documentation. Uh, so, do these things make sense uh, to, I mean, resonate with what went well and with what went wrong also during the presentation? Uh, so things that, you know, like you want to present two or three messages very clearly and so craft all the story of the presentation around those three points. Um, I mean, does it make sense to what it went well for you in your presentation? Or maybe something that you felt when the presentation was maybe for the first in particular was a little bit too, uh, like too many things inside with not clear highlights that maybe then like the audience get lost and make a lot of questions to understand a little bit better. What do you think? I think that in our, from our side, what went well, what went better um, than, than the first one, than the first presentation, was the 
the effectiveness. So going straight, going with the metaphors and uh, using the rule of, of three. So we have three, three scenarios, three design principles for the first and for the second category. And you have to ask a lot in order to be effective. And uh, I, I noticed the, the, the difference. I really, I really did. It's always a good idea to have kind of like an outline of what you're going to talk about. In today's presentation, here's the stuff I'm going to tell you about. They're like, oh, okay. That way, there nobody's ever lost. Like they kind of know, oh, okay. You know, you got these three things, and we're going to go through this, and then we're going to go through this, and then we're going to go through this. So, so you could have said, we have two primary things we're looking for. We've got the bridge thing, and we've got the roller coaster thing. As an example. Um, so I'm just going to give you one or two more little just kind of sort of pointers as just kind of sort of rules of good presentation. So um, one is called the 10-20-30 rule. That for most investor presentations, it's 10 slides, 20 minutes, and a 30.5. Um, what is a font? A font is, is this is a font. Letter size, the size of the letter. So, um, I mean, it doesn't have to be 30, but normally the rule of thumb is take the oldest person in the room, divide their age by two, that's your minimum font size. <laughs> so, if I'm 39, you can have a, you can have a font size of 20, because I'm the oldest person in the room. If you think I'm closer to 60, <laughs> then your minimum font size is 30. So, um, and the purpose is to stimulate interest, not to sell. You can't, like, nothing, nothing happens in a PowerPoint presentation. It just invites people for the next meeting. Invites them to read the report. It's kind of an overview of the report. Or if you want a meeting, ask for a meeting. If it's a final wrap-up, like, this is my last presentation. Here's the final, here's, here's the final major points. Here's the three, four, five things I want you to remember that we, that we did. It's not a chronological, we did this, and then we did this, and then we did this, and then we realized this didn't work, and then we did this, but it didn't work, and then we did this, and it didn't work, and then we finally ended up here, but then once we were here, we changed our mind over to here, but then we ended up over here, and now, now that you're tired and sick of listening to me, let me tell you something that's actually important. We finally just came up with the name of the new brand. Like, you don't want to do that. You want to start with, in today's presentation, we're going to uh, try to convince you to invest the money in the new Wasili uh, cracker for 20-year-olds on the go. I don't know, whatever you think it is. Um, um, and, and if you want them to read the reports, then, then you can even point at the report and say, this is in the appendix here, this is in the appendix there. Because otherwise, if you give them too much information, they're just going to forget half of it. This is what the 10 magic slides look like for most investor presentations. Francesco's got a copy of this. You can use this for future reference. I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily what your presentations will look like. Um, but normally, if you're trying to sell a business, you're trying to sell your business idea, these are the main questions that investors have. You have the title slide. You know, something that looks good. This is where you give them your pitch. Like, they can read the thing up here, but this is when you're, you know, uh, hi, today's presentation, we're going to try to convince you to go ahead and fully fund the immediate implementation of a new uh, Wasa cracker for the Italian market. We think we've come up with something you're going to be very excited about. We think you're going to want to go ahead and, and create this product as a result of this thing. You don't need to read your names, you don't need to read all the things, you don't need to do this. It's kind of sort of up there. And, and one thing that people forget is you've got to put your name on it. Otherwise, I can't tell you that I've been a, I've been a venture capitalist. Like, I've founded five VC <coughs> firms, I've been involved in like six or seven or eight different venture capital firms. I can't tell you the number of times somebody gives me a, a, a business plan. They're like, do you want to give money to these people? I'm like, yeah, this looks pretty good. We should give, these, we should give them a call. No contact information. Really? 
You wrote a 50 page business plan, you didn't put your name and email address on it? Stupid, dead. <laughs> Throw it right in a dead bin. Like, you're too stupid to get money to. Like, like you, gotta, you gotta put your name and contact information on stuff. You'd be shocked at how often that, that's happened. It's crazy. Um, you know, then usually what's the pain, what's the solution, how are you different, right? This usually is, you know, intellectual property or unique differentiator, how are you going to make money, what's the steps you're going to take to get there, who's the competition, we're a bunch of great people, maybe we're missing a couple, maybe some financial projections, if it's an investor presentation, you know, how, how are you going to get your money back? And then maybe some kind of a you know, list of accomplishments or things that you've done, you know, here's where we are in the journey, that kind of thing. So um, this is not necessarily what you're going to do for the, for the sugar presentation, but this is just kind of, and Jessica will ask me to give you some tips on how to do an investment presentation. I think that's kind of it. That's all I really wanted to talk about. Um, uh, but I'm here until 7 o'clock. Um, is there anything anybody wants to talk about that might be of interest to all the teams? I want you to buy it and so on, but how do you make interest in your personal opinion? So I'll stand just because you're filming. <laughs> um, you know, if, uh, first of all, I would say humor is usually a very dangerous thing. If you're a naturally funny person, if many people in your life have told you, oh, Man, you're, you should be a comedian. Like, you're a hilarious, like, you're a natural, funny person. If this doesn't happen to you, like, at least once a week on average, don't do it. Just don't try. Like, don't come up like, hi, let me tell you a joke. Like, it'll probably be below average. And, you, and, and like, nobody cares whether you're a good comedian or not. Um, and so, you know, I think that most of the ways that people start a presentation are Never start by going, hi, um, I'm really nervous, I'm not very good at this. Like, oh, no, like, bleh. Like, you just shot yourself in the foot. Like, I'll decide if you're good or bad. Like, don't start by telling me you're bad. Oh, hi, my English isn't very good. Like, oh, come on. Like, I'll figure out whether your English is good or bad. Like, don't apologize for things. Don't apologize for not being ready. Don't apologize for not speaking well. Don't apologize for being nervous. Just, just, just start. Um, and, and, and I usually would say, start with that kind of essential thing that you want people to remember at the end. And so, um, after reaching out to 130 companies, not one single company has given us a positive reply. Let me tell you about my story that we've gone through and what we've done to try to validate this. But it starts right off the beginning with like, we haven't found anything of interest. Uh, or we've reached out to 37 different companies and five of them are interested and we've had detailed discussions with several of them and we think we're on to something pretty exciting. Let me tell you about it. Or, um, you know, we've started, you know, you suggested that we start a, a service uh, model delivery. Uh, we've been working on that and we think it's going to be successful. We're going to present that here today. Oh, okay. Like, I know why I'm paying attention now. As opposed to, hi, um, this is Jose, and this is Maria, and this is Alain de Vissier de Popo, and this is Russell Dumont. And um, you've already forgotten our names, but you know, I'm majoring in mechanical engineering, and like, Bleh. Like, I've already forgotten half of what you said because it didn't mean anything. It's, um, you know, like, 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 start with something memorable. And it, it, it's, just, it's kind of like writing um, an email. Like, have the subject line say something important. Like, this is an important email. And don't just hit reply to the last one. Like, this is a new thread. This is an important email. And the first line should be, I'm asking you today for a meeting. Here's why I'm asking for a meeting. But don't like, you know, hi, blah, 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 da, 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 da,
great, thank you very much. Um, so I, that, that's how I like to start, is try to start with kind of either a call to action or, or a final recommendation or um, kind of an evaluation of where you think you are. Um, you, know, I, you know, I think we've come up with something really exciting. Let me tell you what we've come up with. Uh, versus, you know, um, well, we're about halfway through the process. We don't really feel like we found the best thing yet. Uh, so we decided to wrap up the project and, and come to a good conclusion um, to, to better understand the, 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 the methodology or something like that. But like, you can all go back to sleep now. Like, we, we, we haven't really found anything exciting. Um, and you don't want to say that unless you have to, but I mean, you want to keep it authentic. Well, you look really unhappy about that. <laughs> you okay? Yeah. Somebody kill your cat this morning or something? <laughs> Tired? Need a cafe? Yeah, I yeah, yeah, it's only going to get worse for you. He's like, what? I'm not personally selfishly interested in anymore. Um, so, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, don't try anything fake or any kind of like, you know, I had, oh my god, a couple of weeks ago in Germany I was doing one of these things, and there were like 15 teams presenting, and this one guy was like, I'm thinking about doing this to be really memorable. I'm thinking about like starting, because we're like team number 8 out of 15, I'm thinking about getting ready to stand up and clap three times, and then being like really excited. I'm like, what are you talking to a five-year-old? Like, wake up little baby, wake up little baby, like, oh, why would you do that? Like, they might remember you as like the bad person that was kind of like, you don't want to be remembered in a bad way. You want to be remembered as, you know, somebody who was a good presenter and, and had something that was meaningful and memorable to say. Somebody who was passionate about what they were doing and looked directly at you and, and spoke well and, you know, didn't kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm standing here, but I'm kind of, yeah. So, like, like, you kind of sort of, your body language says a lot as well, too. Like, if you're kind of sort of standing like this, this is kind of sort of saying, like, eh, I'm too cool to give a shit. You know, I'm too cool to bother to stand on two feet, and, you know, your, your vocal cords, your diaphragms are compressed, and you kind of sort of narrows your, your range of expression. And when you stand up straight, like, you know, you're larger, and you can move your hands around, you can talk a little bit louder, you've got better presence. It might feel weird when you're doing it for the first time, but, like, there's only one proper way to present. It's with your feet planted and kind of like looking directly at the audience and all this other stuff, you know, hand in the pocket. Like, it sucks. Don't do it. Just don't do it. It's just a bad presentation style. Don't train yourself to be a bad presenter. Even if it's uncomfortable, like just... I can talk all day about presentation style. Kind of a bit of a presentation coach. I feel it's, it's going to be only um, practice. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, everything's all about practice. It's like, I, it's, like I will, it's like I will have like a portfolio of good starting points in the end. Well, you've got to be authentic. And, and it's got to have something to do with the project. So it's not like, you know, you know I, I show up, I'm like, okay, opening line number one. Hey, there was an Italian, a German, and a Frenchman. And, you know... <laughs> Hey, like unless you're selling yourself as a comedian, you know, you're probably going to say something sexist or racist or anti-somebody. Like you're, you're bound to upset somebody with most jokes, you know, so things don't, don't do it. <laughs> like all the French people are going to be upset, the Germans are going to be upset, the Italians are like, ah, that was funny, but I'm kind of upset too. <laughs> like, eh, just don't do it. Other questions? Slides to the speech or vice versa or not at all? Like, do you mean together? Do you mean that? Um, I usually find that the slides are a guide to thinking. That, um, you know, it's kind of like outlining a report. Like, here, here, here's what you never want to do. Is it this? I'm shocked at how often my students do this. And you can tell. Like, I can, I, I can absolutely tell when my students do this. Sit behind a computer with a blank screen and just start typing. Like this is like, either you're going to throw away three quarters of what you wrote, or you're going to write a shitty report. Because you're like, you know, <laughs> and you're just writing stuff, and you know, half of it's going to come and go like that. No, no, no. You start with PowerPoint present. You start with bullets, right? You know how to do this. You've been taught this. I'm looking at people. Do you know what outlining means? No? 
Oh my god. So, uh, so, can I erase all this stuff? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm going to do a presentation. First thing I want to do is I want to do something motivational. Uh, I want to talk about like entrepreneurship and some kind of general thing. Entrepreneurship and um, yeah, I want to mention the four points. Four points of entrepreneurship. One, two, three, four, right? There's the new venture, there's the intrapreneurship, there's social entrepreneurship, and there's personal empowerment. Um, yeah, what else do I want to talk about next? Let's see, the second thing I want to talk about in my presentation is I want to talk about something about design thinking and, um, you know, kind of this, you know, design thinking, you know, planning versus searching. I want to talk about that a little bit in my presentation, so I'm going to have a couple slides about that. And then, then, then I want to talk about pitching. I want, I want to make sure I could, Francesco asked me to talk about pitching. So I want to talk about pitching, and I want to mention like the different types of pitches. Um, I want to talk about like the 10, the 10 most important slides. Um, gee, I wanted to mention something about make it personally interesting to you. Yeah, no, I'm gonna, this, so this is going to be four, and three is going to be you know, selfish interest. Yeah, yeah, that's what my that's what my that's what my talk's going to be about. That's what my report's going to be about. And so, okay, so now I'm going to flesh this out in a little more detail. And you're like, you know, I'm going to have the first paragraph. In my first paragraph, I'm going to talk about A, and then points one, two, and three, and then a summary. And then my next paragraph is going to be B, one, two, and three, and then a summary. And then the next thing I'm going to talk about is C, one, two, and then a summary. Yeah, that's what I'm going to, this is called outlining. So you get all your thoughts in order first. And, and, and you can think about this as like a prototype. You know, you kind of want to just kind of get it out there, and you write it on a piece of paper, you do it by hand. And you, the last thing you want to do is start writing whole sentences. And like sitting behind a blank piece of paper, and you're kind of like, you know, you get this weird stream of consciousness, you know, well, we started this project nine months ago. And, you know, we were really excited at the beginning of the project, but then one of our members left, and then this happened, and, like, it, it turns into this kind of sort of random chronological thing, and you have to throw most of it away and just waste a lot of time. And when you do it this way, this, this looks like a PowerPoint presentation. In fact, like, 30 years ago, when PowerPoint, uh, before PowerPoint came out, it wasn't meant as, like, a, um, something that you presented to other people. It was meant as a process by which you outlined your, your stuff before you wrote a report. Because nobody, nobody, did power, nobody did presentations, they all did reports, reports, reports. So kind of sort of the original um, reason for this was kind of sort of just an outline, a structure. And it didn't print slides and it was just kind of like a piece of like, what was it, Word Perfect. It was kind of like an add-in to Word Perfect. It was like how to outline your, your report. And then, you know, each, each bullet point came, you know, became a subject header or became like a section there. So, uh, what was it? so yeah, so to answer your question, I would say always start with the PowerPoint first. And then now that you've got all your things in kind of sort of in order, you got the structure of your presentation, now you can go, okay, what is that motivational opening line going to be? Hmm, you know, am I going to tell you a funny joke about entrepreneurs or am I going to say entrepreneurship is the most empowering, freedom-loving, creative force in the world? Oh, well, that's a pretty motivational opening statement. Wow, entrepreneurship is the single most empowering force in the world. Well, wow, that's interesting. Maybe I, should, maybe I should wake up. Maybe I should pay attention to that. I didn't start with that in case you're feeling bad. You're sitting there going, I didn't. Find. If you told me that, I would have paid attention. Dude, you didn't, you didn't start with that. You started with hi. <laughs> that answer your question? Any other questions? How many different teams are there going to be? Nine, uh, San Francisco. Yeah. 
uh, we expect around 25. They can be like from 20 to 25. So here's an important question to ask. What do you want to get out of that presentation? Like, do you want Bill Bernanke or Ben Bernanke to go, oh man, that was awesome. You should move to Stanford. Like, I want to hire you. You're amazing. You're just a natural presenter. Or are you just going to kind of go, are you trying to make friends? Or are you trying to like make an impression to somebody? Trying to get a job with somebody to kind of go, hey, I want to be a coach. And I was, you know, it, it's, you know, think about that as well too, especially if, if, if the company's not going to be there. Like you don't need to impress, you know, your coaches. Like they already love you. They're paid to love you. <laughs> not me when I'm a coach. I'm paid to be an asshole. <laughs> I'm paid to be the one like, come on, come on, push, 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 you can push, you can push, you can do it, you can do it. Okay, now do two more. Ah, no, I don't want to do two more. Come on, come on, you win, you can do it. Come on, push, 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 push. Uh, okay, do another one. Ah, I hate you. Come on, do one more. Like, that's what a coach does. That's my relationship with most of my students. I'm that guy that, like, pushes them, um, but not so much that they break. <laughs> Mental health is a real problem. <laughs> I'm serious. No, I mean, especially in Canada. Like, you know, here it is. It's beautiful weather in Canada today. It's three degrees. It's rainy. It's cold. It's miserable. It's suicide season. I'm serious. You guys are laughing. My students are killing themselves. The Italian's like, oh, you Canadians are funny. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Anything else? So I'm available till so 7? Maybe we do a <coughs> short break and then we launch a uh, next phase like uh, is a hunting plan and uh, um, planning for the, these like two months. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Have they done any project? Do they know anything about project management? Have you taught them any project management stuff? No, this is like something that. Oh, that's the other thing. You want to talk about? Do you, you want to present something? You want me to present something? No, about I, I, I do mean just that. Find like three minutes introduction to what the process should be about, like in, uh, in this last uh, phase. And then, like, if you could give us some tips on how to make planning and uh, like project management and uh, help the team for the model on this. Do we do it while we're rolling? Do you, 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 you want me to just do that right now, while we're, or do you want to take a break first? Uh, maybe we take a break. Okay, let's take a break first. Yeah. Okay, cool. Like, we break, by the way, guys. Like,